Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you, Dave, for that wonderful introduction. It's so great to be here. So I want you guys to imagine yourself on a rocket ship ride. It's gaining speed, and it is taking off. And inside, it's rattling. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of noise. And you're just holding on for dear life, but loose enough so that you could adapt with the movements of the rocket so you don't get hurt. And this is the ride that every startup hopes to be on. It's why you do what you do. And this has been the journey of Kabam. So a few little tidbits about Kabam. Um, as David mentioned, we started out in downtown Castro in 2006 above a dim sum restaurant, just a couple blocks down from the 500 Startups HQ. We survived 2008, for those who can remember, RIP Silicon Valley, RIP Good Times, that's where capital just froze up literally overnight. And then we went on to grow our revenues from zero to 360 million in four years flat. And then just last week, we got ushered into the Unicorn Club at a valuation north of $1 billion. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the most incredible and critical thing that I've learned on making sure that you're not only surviving this journey, but thriving in this journey is to be adaptable in many ways, particularly your growth strategies. Because this is still a crazy rocket ship ride that we're still on, and it's a journey that I hope all of you will get on as well. So the journey to a billion dollar startup begins with one customer. Oftentimes people ask me, well, how do I even get that first user, let alone the first customer? And I usually say, you start out with the non-scalable growth methods. It's actually what we did in the beginning. It's probably what many of you in this room are doing. And it's really good. So some of them are forum and blog and group postings. We actually really worked on this as well. We try to engage in social media, um, some folks uh, with forums, with really good audiences, leaving comments, is creating conversation. The second ones that we tried were like contests. Those were a little bit harder because the fulfillment was just uh, a bit difficult with the online and the offline. And then finally, the unsung heroes of every startup in this room. It's your friends and your family. We used to have pizza and beer nights where they would come in into, the, into our office and they would bang on our product, give us feedback, rip us apart, and send us back to uh, iterate on the product again. And these methods are non-scalable because it's a lot of energy and very little ROI. But it's incredibly important. Why? Because you're figuring out two things. Well, one, you get to interact directly with your customers. I know we're all a little bit shy in this room, but it's very, very valuable to hear what they're thinking and how they feel about your product. And the second thing, which is incredibly important, is you're looking for that product market fit. Right? You want to first nail it, and then you want to scale it. That sounds very logical. You don't want to scale something that, you're not, that doesn't work. And oftentimes I get asked, well, how do you know when you've nailed it? Well, the simple answer is when your graph looks up and to the right. So this is a picture of our first product manager, uh, Justin Smith. He's a really good friend of the 500 Startups community. And you're taking a look into our first analytics tool. We actually didn't have anything uh, tracked. And we just started writing our weekly install rates. And we were growing at a weekly rate of 20 to 30%. So that is something that is super clear. And we did this through really looking at our growth strategy in line with our business model and really nailing one of the growth methods. And I'll spend more time talking about it. But another accelerator down the street, which I won't name, actually asks its startups to have a growth rate a weekly from 5 to 7%. They want this in revenues, but a good proxy is the users. Anything less than that, I think you're still really looking for that product market fit. Now, once you nail it, there's really only three strategies to really grow scalably. It's building it, building it in your product, it's buying traffic, or it's partnering. Right? And these three strategies should be worked within the context of your business model. You really need to think about how, is it, how does your business model work, and then choose a growth strategy that really makes sense. And then you need to nail one of the methods. The execution needs to just be flawless. So why are these things scalable? Well, the first is there's feedback loops, right? I buy an ad. I know the click-through rates. I know I can follow that user eventually to see if they convert into a paying customer. It's also very easily repeatable, right? So that means I could create a playbook, which also means that maybe I can automate it and make my life a lot easier. And finally, you could do this once and get a massive amount of audience. So if you just think about the method of virality, 
right? I send one invite to 30 friends. Those 30 friends invite their 30 friends and so on and so forth, and it just began with one invite. So within each scalable strategy, as I mentioned, uh, there's a method that you have to nail. So within building, you really have to look at your product to make sure that there's these network effects and really build in things that really make a lot of sense that leverage either SEO or virality. Now the buy growth strategy works very well with the business model if you think that you are going to, if your end user is going to be your customer. You're going to need to get really good at either paid acquisition or sales. And finally, partnering. So partnering is something special that doesn't really have to do as much with your business model and much more where you play within an ecosystem, such as whether you're a content player or a platform player. And I'll talk about those, but you're really gonna have to look at your pipeline and team. So our building strategy, how did we end up choosing that? Well, it started with our fan communities. We grew our fan communities on Facebook from zero to 60 million users. Um, at the height, of our Facebook community, at our fan communities, ABC wanted to distribute their video on Facebook. They actually didn't go to Facebook. They came to us. But we weren't the first fan communities, nor were we the only fan communities on Facebook. So how did we become the largest fan communities? How did we grow? Well, what we did is we thought about our business model. We chose a growth strategy that fit it, and then we nailed the method of virality. We focused a lot around virality, and that's what we chose to do. Now, what, is I, what, what do I mean by looking at our business model, making sure our business goals are all aligned, and thinking about how do you nail the method of growth strategies? Well, your, our business model was an advertising-based business model for our fan communities. We knew that we probably were not gonna get money from the end user. So our whole goal was to build as large of an audience as possible. So this really affected what type of growth strategy we were gonna choose, and it also affected how did we look at our business goals. So I believe that any startup needs to be looking at business goals within these four areas, right? It makes a lot of logical sense for a product cycle of a product as well as your business model, right? So it's acquisition, retention, engagement, and monetization. Acquisition is the thing that we're talking about in this room. How do I get users in the door? And then retention, how do I keep bringing them back once they've come in the door? And then once they've come in the door, how are they engaging in the product? How, much, how long are they staying? And then Obviously, who is going to pay for the value that you provide? What problem are you solving? For us, we knew that we were going to be an advertising-based business model, so it made sense that we're going to try to build the largest audience as possible. We focused a lot of our product around acquisition, and we built a lot of virality into it. So um, what do I mean by that we built a lot of virality into it? As you can see, um, there's no shortage of invite buttons on here. This is a, an early uh, screenshot of some of our fan communities. We, we had fan communities that were, uh, they were very passionate, so they wanted to share. So we made it very easy for them to share. We built features where they wanted to tell their friends. So for our, uh, for our, our sports communities, we had send a wave. So these Boston Red Sox fans could send a wave that said, I hate the Yankees, and they could, they could continue to send it on. For our TV shows, um, we always gave them context to when they were send, sending an invite, right? We said, hey, you know what? 33 of your friends have Arrested Development as their favorite TV show, and they don't have this app. All of a sudden, we made that person who's sending out the invite become a very positive referrer, rather than somebody who's just being quote unquote spammy. Now, that's what I mean by trying to nail and execute virality. So taking a look back into the framework, we looked at the business model of advertising revenue, and then we chose, uh, we really focused our business goals around acquisition. Spent a lot of time trying to think about how do we acquire users, how do we get a mass amount of large audience. Then uh, we chose a growth strategy that would really support that and really try to nail virality. This also affects the kind of metrics that we looked at. Um, I was told this community likes to get a little down and dirty, so uh, these were some of the metrics that, that we looked at and spent a lot of time just kind of going through each of them. We had a lot of click-throughs. We had a whole document tracking of every single link and how many times was it being clicked. There was installs and conversions, right? We cared once they clicked on something, did, how many installs, how many conversions did it create? And then how many invites did they send? Because we cared a lot about the, the viral factor, or at that time it was called the K factor. And then DAUs, how many daily active users were there? So if you are in this room and your business model is to be an advertising-based revenue model, you're going to care a lot about how are you going to build scalable growth within your product. 
And if you do that, you should really nail the method of either SEO or virality to make sure that you can get as wide of an audience as possible. Now, Kabam um, also uh, really try to work and get really good at the buying scalable method. Now, the reason why we had to go into the buying scalable method was because we actually had to change our business model. So I mentioned that we survived 2008. Um, during that time, I don't know if you remember, but capital had frozen up overnight. A lot of venture capitalists um, had sent out notes and said, RIP, good time, Silicon Valley. And um, it was just a really, really tough time for our advertising revenue-based business model. Our revenue just kind of dried up overnight. Many advertisers were, were not interested. And there wasn't anything we could do. So we sat there and we kind of looked at each other and we said, should we keep on pushing down this business model that's going to be really difficult to get traction? Or do we still want to keep at it? And we decided, hey, I think we want to keep at it. So we looked at three things. What, like, what did we want to do? We knew that this advertising business model probably wasn't going to be as sustainable. We said, well, you know what? Let's look at market opportunity and team capabilities and passion points. These were three things we looked at. So the first thing we looked at is what's recession proof? Well, games are incredibly uh, recession proof. And in fact, Facebook games were taking off during this time. Our team capabilities. We, were, we had over about 60 years of collective experience building Facebook, Facebook applications. Uh, what better team to take this opportunity? And finally, what were our passion points? We were incredibly passionate about games. In fact, the CEO, um, really was really wanted to make sure to bring some deeper engaging games starting with Facebook. He loved playing games, grew up playing games, and really wanted to try this. So with that, our business model pretty much changed overnight. Um, it, it changed to what we call a free-to-play business model. And for those who are not familiar in gaming, um, I think Silicon Valley likes to call it a freemium microtransaction business model. So super <laughs> fancy for something very short with free-to-play. And really, very simply put, it's just Basically, our games are free to play, and if you want to, say, speed up your building or get a special sword, you can pay money, or you can spend more time and you can earn it. So overnight, our business model changed. That means a lot of other things changed as well, right? Um, now, instead of uh, thinking about advertisers paying money, I had to think about the end user would eventually be our customer. So I had to start building a relationship directly with the customer and provide so much value that they would want to pay and trust us with their money. Our business goals changed, our business goal focus has changed as well. I didn't care as much about building the largest amount of audience because I cared about the customer, right? So then I cared a lot around retention and monetization. And then our growth strategy really changed as well. We really focused on how can we buy traffic? And then we got really good at paid acquisition. So some of the metrics that we looked at had to do with retention and monetization, which all leads up to LTV. So uh, day one retention, that's what we looked at. It's really once the user installs the app, how many, what percentage of them come back. And then we also looked at a weekly retention, right? After about seven days, how often do they come back? We also cared about ARPU, which is average revenue per user. And there was a huge debate about what's a user. Is it somebody that just installs the app or finishes the tutorial? For us, it's somebody who installs, or not installs the app, but finishes the tutorial. And then we have the RPPU, which is average revenue per paying user. And all this is to factor into what we call the LTV. Now, the LTV is the lifetime value of the customer, and it's the holy grail for the business model if you think of your user as going to be your end customer. So very simply put, an LTV is really your average order value multiplied by the number of repeat sales times the average retention time. So if I was in the magazine business, uh, probably still wouldn't be here, but as a magazine business, if you're selling a $10 monthly issue over 12 months, it's $120. And if the customer sticks around for about three years, then their lifetime value is about $360. That is a very, very simple case. Um, more complicated is uh, an example from Starbucks. Uh, they actually combine, they do a lot of cohort analysis, and they combine the simple LTV average it with their custom LTV, and multiply it by their traditional LTV. And you can see a really great infographic of what all these variables mean with KISS metrics. Um, but the thing is, is once you find the lifetime value of your customer, because your end user is going to be its customer, then you can get success. You can actually start figuring out what is the cost of your customer acquisition, right? 
because you can find out how much they're going to eventually pay. So let's go back to that magazine, uh, magazine example. So would it make sense to spend $20 to acquire the user? Actually, maybe that's not a bad idea. Because you know what? Within two months, you're going to get not only your marketing dollars back, but you're going to know that they're going to stay for three years, and they're going to keep on funding money that you could put back into the business. So that's what Kabam did. We spent a lot of time getting good at figuring out what our LTV was and looking at that paid acquisition to grow our revenues from zero to 360 million. So for those of you in this room who have a business model of looking at the end user as the customer, then you really need to really focus probably your growth strategy around buying. And then you really need to nail paid acquisition or build a really good sales pipeline. And finally, partnering. So partnering is something that's very special and actually very good and something that you could probably start right now. Partnering really has to do a lot with how you play in the ecosystem of content as well as platform. So we always say, we usually say content is king and we usually say, hey, if content is king, then your platform is your kingdom. There's a lot of great synergies and partnerships that happen there. But you as your business need to think about, are you a content play, are you a platform play, which way are you attacking first? Now, if you're somebody who is building a platform and you need content, then more than likely you're gonna be building a BDN sales team. So for us, an example is we have a Kabam publishing platform. What we care about is taking game developers, finding the best game developers, and redistributing their games on our platform. So we built up a BD team that will go and find the best game developers out there and come back and distribute that. The next is content. This is probably something you guys can do. We started doing it at a very, very small level. So we're also a games company and we also call that content. So we, we at, we're at a size where we partner with places like Hollywood to, to find new content for our games. But we also want our games as on many platforms as possible. So we want to go on, say, Android or iOS. Um, but early on, we did this um, with our fan communities. You can easily find somebody who um, is kind of similar to you in an application or um, product and do an ad swap. We did this early on with our Addicted to Simpsons app and Zynga Poker. I wish we still had uh, the message from Mark Picas asking us to do an ad swap. And that actually gave us a really good test lift to really figure out a couple of things, test some of certain features like our trivia app. The other thing that we did on the platform is we wanted to make sure that our content was easily distributed. So we didn't just build these fan applications for Facebook, we also did it for Bebo. I don't know if many people remember Bebo, but it's making a comeback, as well as MySpace, and that one should be making a comeback as well. So, but at the time, they were really big, and we were trying to um, get our content out as much as possible and partnering as much as possible with these platforms. And finally, just a, a short word about tracking. Um, once you go into partnering or any type of what we call organic growth virality, it's really good if you could start tagging things so you can see where your traffic is coming from, which partners are working well, which partners aren't working well, and then eventually you want to associate revenue with those organics. So really, there's only three ways to scale growth. Um, it's building, it's buying, and it's partnering. And in order to get a ticket on that rocket ship ride, you should be able to know when to choose the right strategy, and then you certainly want to nail the methods underneath them. Now, I want you to go back and imagine yourself in that rocket ship again. It's loud, there's a bunch of pressure, and there's a lot of uncertainty. My hope for you is that you would know when to use and, wh what, when to use and how to use each scalable growth strategy. Because knowing when and how is going to make sure that you are adaptable in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Now, rocket ship rides are not for the faint of heart. It's for the chosen few that are in this very room. So now, go and have the ride of your life. Thank you. <laughs>